Mina, konbanwa, Jesus Freaking Gamer here. Coming at you with that sermon I talked about a few days ago, and there's a lot to unpack. There's a lot that needs to be done and a lot that needs to do. So I'm going to do my best. Um, have I set my timer? I have not. I'm going to do that right now. Ah, don't you disappear from me. <laughs> I'm using my cell phone timer. This is great. You got a camera check at the beginning of a sermon. How cool is that? We're going to be covering the part in Judges where the Israelites didn't drive out all the inhabitants of the land and God said, fine, I'm going to leave them there. I'm not going to help you drive them out anymore. And now it's going to be a test for you. I want to go into that, explain it, and I'm going to be doing a lot of reading here. So today's Sunday. It's a 30-minute sermon, maybe longer. Hopefully not. We'll see. I make no promises, zero promises in regards to the time. I may indeed go over like a good bastard should. So we're going to start in Judges chapter 1, <clears throat> and we're going to start at verse 27. I'm just going to read down. I think I'll like, if I go into a new chapter, I'll say, hey, here's the chapter. But as far as verses go, I'm not going to say like verse 27, verse 28, etc. I'm just going to keep on reading. So start in Judges chapter 1, verse 27, and we're going to go from there. However, Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Sheen and its villages. By the way, I'm no Hebrew expert. If I'm saying these names wrong, I apologize right now. Doing the best I can. And if that's if it's horrible, then it'll just have to be horrible. Of Beth Sheen and its villages, or Tanakh and its villages, or the inhabitants of Dor and its villages, or the inhabitants of Iblim and its villages, or the inhabitants of Megiddo and its villages, for the Canaanites were determined to dwell in that land. And it came to pass when Israel was strong that they put the Canaanites under tribute, but did not completely drive them out. So several villages in Manasseh's territory, it says the Canaanites were determined to dwell in that land. I'm guessing that they had a little bit of strength, they were strong, and they, you know, they weren't just going to, they didn't retreat, they didn't run away, they stood and fought, and they were able to defend their cities apparently pretty well because Israel wasn't able to immediately drive them out. When Israel was strong, they put them under tribute. They did not completely kill them off. And that does mean every man, woman, and child. Still not getting into the genocide thing. I will cover that at some point. I will go into that and why biblically God is just to do that. Because God is just in making that choice. And hopefully you won't just turn out, tune out the rest of the sermon or turn away just because I said that. Um, it is in the Bible. I don't plan on shying away from it. That's just not the focus of today's message. So they were supposed to kill everybody. They didn't. And that was a problem. Nor did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites who dwelt in Gezer. So the Canaanites dwell in Gezer among them. Um, no other commentary. They simply didn't drive them out. No reason given on the Canaanite side or the Ephraimite side. So they simply didn't drive out the Canaanites who dwelt in Gezer, and the Canaanites dwelt in Gezer among them. Why? Who knows? The Bible doesn't say. So, moving along. Nor did Zebulun drive out the inhabitants of Kitron or the inhabitants of Nahalal. So the Canaanites dwelt among them and were put under tribute. So the Canaanites weren't necessarily determined to stay, Yes, I, I tend to read the Bible very literally. This is a historical segment, not a poetic segment, so I simply take it at its word. I don't know the details that aren't mentioned. I only know the details that are mentioned. So it doesn't say that the Canaanites were necessarily strong or determined. They simply didn't drive them out, and they were put under tribute. That sounds like they could have driven them out. They didn't. They simply put them under tribute. Why did they put them under tribute and not drive them out? Who knows? Were the Canaanites determined, uh, like the ones for the, Man for the Manassites? Maybe. We don't know. Maybe the Ephraimites simply, or I'm sorry, the Zebulonites, maybe they simply wanted to someone to tax. Maybe they thought it would be more profitable. Who knows? We don't know which one. Maybe it wasn't either of those. Maybe it was a third option entirely. Nor did Asher drive out the inhabitants of Akko, or the inhabitants of Sidon, or of Alab, Akzib, Helba, Afik, or Rehab. So the Asherites dwelt among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. So no tribute and no resistance. They simply didn't drive them out. 
I did mention this a few days ago. I'm going into much more detail today because I want to cover as much of this in detail as I can. I think there's a lot we can pull from this. And so I'm going, I'm doing a study just verse by verse, detail by detail. So just already at this point, a lot of the different tribes were, they either fought against these various tribes or apparently, maybe there wasn't even a fight here. Um, apparently the Asherites, it doesn't say that they, it simply says they didn't drive them out. Like, not that there was resistance, not that they put them under tribute, so there wasn't like any fighting at all. They simply did not drive them out. And even the verse, 30, verse 32 concludes, for they did not drive them out. That's all it says. So it's like all the tribes had different reasons, different circumstances, different enemies, and for whatever reason, they didn't do as the Lord commanded, and they didn't drive the inhabitants out. I infer from that that there were several different reasons, that there were several different specific circumstances. I don't think the Bible, the Bible could have very simply said, this tribe didn't drive out these guys, this tribe didn't drive out these guys, and this tribe didn't drive out these guys. No, it leaves specific details for each tribe and specific ites and specific cities that were left unconquered. And it does give reasons here and there, and sometimes it lists no reason at all. I do infer from that that if no reason is listed, maybe, uh, you know, not even, they didn't even put them under tribute. So it sounds like they simply didn't try. And also, Asher, a lot more towns are listed than the other tribes. So it sounds like Asher, it's like they just kind of stopped at some point. Could be completely wrong. There could be reasons the Bible didn't mention. I'm inferring from this that the tribes, they had, their, you know, since some reasons were mentioned, if no reason at all is mentioned, it sounds like they simply stopped. They simply quit. I don't think that's a bad inference or necessary. It may not be completely correct, but I don't think it's completely incorrect either. We don't know what we don't know the exact story unless the Bible or any historical document gives specific details. So, but I don't think it's I also don't think it's wrong to infer from a story, be it the Bible or some other historical document. If some specific story mentions in some places and not in others, one of two things, either the details weren't known or the details were known and they simply chose not to make mention of it. For whatever reason, they chose not to document that. So Asher, it's not like a bunch of lazy guys. That's kind of what I get from this. Asher, like, so we have Manasseh. The Canaanites were determined to dwell in the land. And when Israel was strong, they put them under tribute, didn't drive them out. Ephraim simply didn't drive them out. Zebulun, they were eventually put under tribute. And Asher just didn't do a thing. The, like Ephraim mentions the Canaanites who dwelt in Gezer, Asher, there were several towns that they simply didn't drive them out. Nor did, and moving down to verse 33, since it's been a while, I'll mention the verse here, nor did Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh or the inhabitants of Beth Anath, but they dwelt among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land. Nevertheless, the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh and Beth Anath were put under tribute to them. So, nothing mentioned about the Canaanites, um, insisting on dwelling in the land or their determination, just that those two particular towns were put under tribute. So again, they left some people there, put them under tribute, did not destroy them. And the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountains. Now that's a, I'll pause there, that's a lot more than simply the Canaanites were determined to dwell in the land. No, the Danites got their butts handed to them. They, were, they forced the children of Dan into the mountains. They couldn't get into the territory where the Amorites were, for they would not allow them to come down to the valley. There was some definite strength there. And the Amorites were determined, there's the determination, were determined to dwell in Mount Herez, in Ajalon, and in Shalbim. Yet when the strength of the house of Joseph became greater, they were put under tribute. So they, they were, the Amorites were strong. They forced the children of Dan into the mountains. Of the, and they were determined to stay in Mount Herez, in Ajalon, and in Shalbim. And when the strength of the house of Joseph... Now, Dan, the house of Joseph consisted of two Israelite tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim. So they needed some help to even put these guys under tribute. Apparently, the Amorites that dwelt in the mountains were fairly strong. They weren't able to drive them out immediately. Back in the book of Joshua... 
several chapters back. It mentions, um, actually it might have been the children of Joseph who said, we can't drive certain people out. And, jo and um, the story was that we, I'll say, you know what, I, I have a 30 minute message, how about I just go back to it? I just, I saw it right before I started up the message. Let's just go back to it. And I don't plan on editing this out. A pastor wouldn't be allowed to edit out any part of his message. If something was missing or he wanted to throw something in, he'd have to look it up. So I'm not going to edit that out. Not to mention it's simply easier for me to not edit it out. <laughs> am, I, am I failing to rise to a level of excellence? <laughs> am I failing there, guys? <laughs> Joshua chapter 17, verse 14. Then the children of Joseph, and Joseph is mentioned in verse 35 in Judges chapter 1. The children of Joseph spoke to Joshua, saying, Why have you given us only one lot and one share to inherit, since we are a great people, and as much as the Lord has blessed us until now? So Joshua answered them, If you are a great people, then go up to the forest country and clear a place for yourself there in the land of the Perizzites and the giants, since the mountains of Ephraim are too confined for you. And that also doesn't mention the children of Dan going into mountains. So I would... I would guess from that that this, uh, even though it's the children of Joseph, it's two different, it's two different places here, two different mountains. The one's the mountains of Ephraim, in the book of Joshua, and one are the mountains that Dan's trying to get into, in the book of Judges. But the children of Joseph said, "This is again Joshua 17, going down to verse 16." But the children of Joseph said, "The mountain country is not enough for us, and all the Canaanites who dwell in the land of the valley have chariots of iron." both those who are in of Beth Sheen and its towns and those who are of the valley of Jezreel. And Joshua spoke to the house of Joseph, to Ephraim and Manasseh, to both of them, saying, You are a great people and have great power. You shall not have only one lot, but the mountain country shall be yours. Although it is wooded, you shall cut it down, and its farthest extent shall be yours. For you shall drive out the Canaanites, though they have iron chariots and are strong. So that's a diff that's a different set of people there, that was um in back in Joshua, having to turn back there, because I probably should have kept my place there. That was talk that was dealing with um Joseph, in the mountains of Ephraim and dealing with the parasites. In Judges chapter one, you see Joseph helping out the tribe of Dan against the Amorites. So those are two different people. That, um, that the tribe of Joseph had to deal with. Or I should say the tribes of Joseph, Manasseh and Ephraim. And so again, kind of like what I said earlier, different, since I see certain details in certain places, I'm inferring there are different circumstances. It's not just, the Bible's not just making this stuff up as it goes and it's not just throwing things at you out of nowhere. There were specific tribes, specific places, specific enemies, and specific circumstances for the reason that they transgressed the covenant of the Lord. And then, and then um, Judges chapter 1, verse 36, to finish the chapter up. Now the boundary of the Amorites was from the ascent of Akrabim from Selah and upward. And that goes into the children of Dan and the Amorites they were trying to, to um, force out. And chapter 2 deals more with the transgression of the children of Israel in regards to not driving these people out. I've mentioned it several times in the past week or two that the children of Israel, and Joshua mentions it plainly, there were certain tribes that did not drive out certain ites. There are so many ites mentioned. I mentioned in another one of my talking videos, another one of my encouraging words videos. Drive out the ites. So, no, there, I think pretty much all the tribes, I, I didn't study ahead of time to see, okay, which tribe didn't drive out which ites. But most of the tribes, at the very least it was most, if not all, had a few ites in them that eventually drew them away from the Lord. They were told to clear out the land. They were told to kill every man, woman, and child, to leave no one breathing, and that the land was to be theirs and theirs alone. Otherwise... There got, those, those people would be a snare to them, they would intermingle, and they would eventually fall to the gods of that land. And we see all the way back in Joshua that the people were disobedient. And that does imply Joshua's disobedience to the Lord there as well. He was the titular head 
of the Israelites at this time. He kind of, he wasn't like the dictator of the 12 tribes, but he certainly headed them up, just as Moses headed them up. So by not, by not enabling or pushing the Israelites to drive out all the people, and he encouraged the people of Joseph, hey, you'll drive those people out. You'll make it. You'll have victory. But apparently, Joseph wasn't the only problem. There were several tribes that didn't drive out all the people from their land. And Joshua is the leader. He's held responsible for that transgression, for breaking that covenant with the Lord. So on to Judges chapter 2, which I skipped a day ago because I wanted more time to look into it today. Then the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I led you up from Egypt and brought you to the land of which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Before I move on to verse 3, I, a reminder is really not needed of this, whether you're atheist or Christian or what have you. Pretty much everyone knows the story of Moses and Egypt and the ten plagues. Pretty much everyone's heard that story. And if you by chance haven't, that's okay. The story goes like this. Israel was in bondage to Egypt. At that time, they were the most powerful nation on the face of the planet. No one could oppose them. Look that up, in, not just in the Bible, look that up in any archaeological, paleontological dig. At that time, in this period of history, Egypt was the power on earth. No one could stand against them. And the Israelites were slaves in this nation. God, with his mighty hand, brought a bunch of slaves out of the land of Egypt and into the land of Canaan with several displays of miraculous power. The Egyptians got wrecked. To mention some of the plays, the entire Nile became blood and all the fish in the Nile died. I think it lasted for a period of seven days. Then another plague, all, the, all of the dust of the land became gnats. The land was covered in frogs. The land was covered in complete darkness for, I think, about three days where you couldn't even see your hand in front of your face, not even during the day. Um, and, then, and then there was a giant hailstorm mixed with fire. <laughs> what the heck? Talk about a story of fire and ice. References. And then finally, the plague where God killed all the firstborn of the land of Egypt. Old and young. I have no, the Bible doesn't say old and young, but since it says all the firstborn, just kind of period, I believe that all does mean all. There doesn't seem to be any room to make an exception there. God said, Israelites, you mark your houses with the blood of the lamb, more references, over your doorposts and on your mantle. Otherwise, the angel of death will strike your children too. So since even Israel wasn't excluded from that particular plague, it was excluded from some of the latter plagues, but God said, if you don't mark your doors with the blood, this plague will hit you. So in that plague, they killed, that sounds pretty inclusive to me. So yeah, all the firstborn, regardless of the age of the firstborn, regardless of the gender, all the firstborn of the humans and the animals were killed by God. All of that to say, we have a God who is capable of doing this, all of this, and you keep reading further into the history of the Old Testament, there's nothing God isn't capable of doing. Obviously, he created the entire heavens and earth in seven days. If he wants to create something, he'll create it. If he wants to destroy something, he'll destroy it. The Israelites had no excuse under any circumstances to not have victory here. That's the real bottom line. Yes, there were chariots of iron. Yes, some of the Canaanites were determined. Sometimes, apparently, the Israelites just didn't care and were just straight up lazy. Either they didn't do anything at all, and they simply, the people remain un, um, undone, like um, in verses 31 and 32 of Judges chapter 1, where Asher simply didn't drive them out. The Canaanites were determined. It doesn't mention. They didn't put them under tribute. They simply didn't drive them out. And then other ones, like the tribe of Dan, they needed help. To get the Am they were forced out. They the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountains, and they needed Joseph's help to put them under tribute. But they didn't utterly kill everyone there, even when Joseph did help them out. 
So you have some people who just are plain lazy. Yes, I'm using my inferences as absolute statements now. Uh, I'll go ahead and admit that right up. Um, you have some tribes who were doing nothing to drive out all the inhabitants of the land. Then you had some tribes where they had some pretty fierce adversaries. And they even needed help from another tribe to drive those adversaries out. And in this case, put them under tribute. But there was no reason. There was no reason for them to leave anyone alive. If God said, kill them all, they should have and could have killed them all. If God was on their side, there's no reason they could not win. Not the God who got a bunch of slaves out of the most powerful nation on earth at the time. There's no reason that they couldn't have won. Well, why were they struggling at all, I guess would be the next question. Why was there any struggle? Why was there any problem driving out various ites of the land? I'm keeping my eyes on the timer there. At this point, God got them out of Egypt. He got them out of the land of bondage. He got them out of their slavery. That was on him. Now that they're going into the promised land, they've got to start taking up some responsibility. Um, I may or may not have focused in on this, on this particular message. This goes all the way back to Joshua chapter 1. Once the Israelites crossed over the Jordan and came into the promised land, before they even conquered any territory, the manna was cut off. I say before they conquered any territory, that part may be, tr may be untrue. I may not have quoted that correctly. I didn't research that before the message. Go back and look it up yourself. Please research all of this behind me. Make sure that I read the verses correctly. It's the New King James Version, by the way, in case anyone's curious. That's what I've always used. That's what I'm using now. now I don't plan on changing that any time in the future. I love the New King James Version personally. My personal pick of Bible English translations. <clears throat> Once they came into the promised land, it was, I forget, I don't know if it even mentions who they conquered or who they didn't, but once they had gotten their first harvest in the promised land, once they had gotten some food for themselves, at that point the manna was cut off. For 40 years, keep in mind, for 40 years, they had a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night guiding them, telling them when to move and when to camp. When it was moving forward, they followed it. When it stopped, they camped. And God did various things, such as teaching them how to camp and in what order where all the tribes should be in the encampment. He was teaching them those things while they were in the wilderness. And also the 40 years itself was a punishment for that old generation who continuously rebelled against God. So once they get into the promised land, a lot of the miracles disappeared. There wasn't a pillar of cloud by day or a pillar of fire by night to guide everyone collectively. Moses, the great leader who'd wrought so many miracles, he had died. He, he'd, moved, he'd moved on to heaven. And there's some debate about heaven in the Old Testament. God not getting into that either. As far as I'm concerned, he went to heaven. He went to be with the Lord. And so we have Joshua raised up as the leader, and he's leading them into the promised land. Once they get their first harvest, there's no more manna. So once they crossed the Jordan, I mean, that was a miracle in and of itself. The Jordan was, was stopped way up, giving the children of Israel plenty of land to walk across. So it's not like they didn't see the works of the Lord. They didn't know the Lord was with them. They did know. They had seen these things. But there comes a point after the, after the land of bondage, and after the wilderness, going to the promised land, they had to start fighting for themselves. They had to exert some effort. And even though the Bible doesn't mention it, I have no doubt that some of the Israelite soldiers died conquering the promised land. War is war. Yes, the Lord's with them. Yes, the Lord, I mean, he, the Lord doesn't need help. I don't know why I closed it. I need to, I'm not, I feel, well, I think I'm almost up to my 30 minutes. I, I'm going to try to do better with my time here. I said I might go over 30 minutes. I'm really going to try to like do this correctly. I, I, and I owe you guys a 30 minute sermon, another 30 minute sermon anyway from where my camera recording was messing up. So I'll, maybe I'll just do a part two tomorrow or someday this week. Maybe that's when I'll do that. I guess the bottom line here is there was no reason that they couldn't completely kill everyone in the land like God told them to. There's no reason that they couldn't win. There was a, they had a God 
who got a bunch of slaves out of the most powerful nation of the world, fed, led them by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, provided them manna literally out of nowhere for 40 years, burned the top of Mount Sinai, wrote with his own finger into stone the Ten Commandments, and when it came, and even, well, and I will say, that generation, even in the middle of all that supernatural stuff, that generation died in the wilderness because they didn't follow the Lord. Now, this generation after them, going into the promised land, they similarly transgressed against the Lord. And that right there is a pattern. That right, and that right there, I think that'll lead into the conclusion of this message. Guys, my freaks, those who are subscribed, and the non-freaks who are simply watching this, maybe even some trolls who are watching and you've made it this far just for the fun of it, God bless you. Thank you for hanging in there, regardless of your trolly intentions. Everyone of all ages and all times are sinners, period. We all mess up. We all drop the ball. And most of the time, we drop it bad. Most of the time, we do very, very badly. Most of the time, when we fail... It's, a, it's on a pretty good level. It's on a very bad level. So with that, I would like to extend the invitation to those of you who don't know Christ. Come to know Him. The God of the Old Testament, uh, we know Him as YHWH. That's the Tetragrammaton for those who are theologically inclined because we don't know the vowels or the pronunciation at that time. But we do know the God of the Old Testament nowadays because He came as a man. He was born of the Virgin Mary, and his name is Jesus. Because he doesn't just love the people of Israel. He doesn't just love the Jews. He loves the entire world. He wants everyone to be a part of his family. He wants all humans that he created to be his children. Because we're not born his children. We're born sinners. We're born in the image of our parents who have sinned. We ourselves, we've sinned. And if we're honest, if you really look into your own heart and your own actions, we've sinned a lot. We, might, we pretty much live for ourselves. We do a lot of bad stuff that the Bible does condemn. So if you currently aren't a Christian, I'd like to invite you right now to become one. God's arms are wide open, he, and He's ready to forgive all those sins, all those transgressions. He's ready to get you out of the land of bondage. He's ready to deliver you from the bondage of sin. And he has a promised land he wants to bring you into. And he knows you're going to mess up. He knows you're going to fail along the way. He still loves you. And just as he didn't eradicate Israel, and just as the Jews are alive to this day, he doesn't want to eradicate us. He wants to forgive us. And in his mercy, he waits long for us to repent. So God's reaching out his hand to you right now. Reach your hand out back to him. Believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you rose again three days later, guaranteeing you eternal life with Him in heaven forever, and guaranteeing you victory in this life as well. Maybe not in the way you're imagining or hoping or thinking, but there's victory in Jesus for you today. So take, he, God's already taken that step. He's given us a love letter. It's called the Bible. He's given the biggest sacrifice that He could possibly give His own life on the cross. Reach out your hand back to Him. Acknowledge that you're a sinner. Acknowledge that you need His help. Acknowledge that you believe that He was God and that He died on the cross and that He rose again. And if you'd like a prayer, it's like if you want to put, like something a little more formulary to put these words into, pray this prayer with me right now. Say, Lord Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner. I admit I have made mistakes and I admit I haven't served you. And Lord God, I want to ask you to forgive me right now for those sins, for those wrongdoings. I believe that you died on the cross for me, and I believe that you rose again three days later. And I accept your sacrifice for my sin. Please be my Lord and Savior, Jesus. And thank you that you have forgiven me, and that now you're my God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And if you just prayed that, that is awesome. Welcome to the family. Welcome to the family of God. Please find a group of believers, hopefully a church, that believe in the Bible as the Word of God. 
that Jesus Christ is God and Lord. Find like-minded people to encourage you and to push you forward in your walk with Him. Make sure you talk to Him a little bit every day. Make sure you, I don't know, you can simply say, Good morning, God. How are you doing today? You know, that's a prayer. Prayer is nothing more than talking to God. It is that simple. It doesn't have to be eloquent. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be something unique and original. It can be the same old stuff. Just talk to Him. Make sure you stay in touch with Him. And grab a Bible. Grab a Bible and start digging and start reading it. Uh, start reading pretty much anywhere. If I had to make a recommendation, the Gospel of John's pretty universally recommended as the first place to begin. The, book of John, the Gospel of John in the New Testament really is good. It's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. First before books of the New Testament. And John is really good. But you can start anywhere you want. Start the journey right where you are. You don't need... You don't need really anything but Jesus to start the journey as a Christian. That's really, that, that's the beginning. That's the most important thing. That's the foundation of your faith right there. So hopefully this message ministered to you guys. Hopefully it made sense. I plan on covering a little bit more in detail. Probably another 30-minute sermon at some point later on this week, like I owe everyone on this channel anyway. So if you watch this whole video, thank you very much for watching. I love you guys. God bless.